there, how are you? Welcome to happy hour. How exciting, how great to see everybody. A lot of sort of familiar faces and, and actually a, a few people who I, who I only know from social media and some people I have no idea who they are at all. So we're yeah. gonna have to do a little roll call, but we're doing a little Negroni moment. We're gonna start with the Negroni, which is one of my favorite um, cocktails. And, and listen, it's no surprise, it's pretty much everyone's favorite cocktail. It has become the number one cocktail, if you didn't know, all over the world, which I find to be shocking because it's actually I find it quite a complicated flavor uh, when you when you drink it. And, but the, let me get into the details. Uh, before I make it, I want to tell you a little bit about the cocktail because I'm fascinated. And you may know if you listen to Shake and Stir, I'm fascinated with the history of cocktails. And Negroni has one of the best, one of the coolest, one of the most disputed histories out there. Um, it originates back in the 1800s, 1880s, when you first sort of hear about this fantastic cocktail. And it, it comes from something called an Americano, which essentially is a bitters, which is, I've got Campari here, a vermouth and soda water, right? So that was the original, but even, even the Americano comes from a drink called the Milano Torino, which is only these two. Right, so that was the original original in the 1880s, the very where it started, and it turns out the Americans kind of liked it, but it was a bit strong for them. So what do Americans do? They added <laughs> a little bit of soda water, and hence the name the Americano. Um, and there was a, a count. Now this is all legend. He used to live in the UK, even though he was Italian. So check this out in the 1880s, right? Uh, and he travelled to the America became a cowboy, became a gambler, uh, and then uh, came back to uh, Italy, went to Milan, and in 1919, so we're talking literally 102 years ago, uh, went to a bar called Cassano, um, and went up to his bartender and said, you know what, I've been drinking this Americano, but I would like if you could make it a little stronger, right? And I've actually been to this very place, this very bar, and uh, they, you know, the guy was like, OK, let me see what I can do to make this a little bit stronger for you. And what did he do? He swapped out the soda water for gin. It was quite a move. And the guy started drinking it. He loved it. And you know what? The guy also did something unusual. He took out the lemon, which you find in an Americano, and he put in an orange. That was another little twist. Now, that bartender was literally a genius mixologist because that became and has become the most popular cocktail in the history of cocktails. All his pals started to ask, hey, you know, what, what, can I have what Count Negroni's having? And before you knew it, this drink, legend has it, was, became known as the Negroni. Now, I say legend because there is a big dispute here. The Negroni family is a big family, a well-known family. And there are people out there in the family who say, this is not true. There is no Count Negroni. There was never a Count, an actual Count Negroni. Now, there is a General Negroni who, um, who claims, and that side of the family claim, that General Negroni actually created this drink in Africa, of all places, not in Europe whatsoever. And, that it, it, and, and there was actually provenance to the fact that that family um, has their own vermouth, their own, and so it, this is an interesting part. So that they actually did create a vermouth, and so that sweet vermouth mixed with the bitters, and then they put in gin. And if you know the military, and certainly uh, the, the European military when they were in Asia and they were in Africa, used to drink a lot of gin. And why? Because, you know, if you were drinking with gin and you were drink, drinking tonics, the tonic wor uh, water had quinine in it, which helped you, um, you know, it was a, as a cure, if you like, or a repellent uh, for malaria, right? So gin was in, in people's sort of, in their bars in that part of the world, especially in the military. So this, this story starts to come together. Anyway, there's, there are even more stories than this when it comes to Negroni. So you have to pick the one you want. I actually like the Count Negroni one. And if you get to come to another one of these happy hours, I have stories like this for literally every cocktail, but this is a good one. And now let's just make it first of all. So here you go, if you're gonna make it along with me. First of all, get your favorite glass. This is blue glass here. It says Kim Chris, that's my wife and my sister-in-law. This comes from their father's boat. And I've had this glass for 30 years, just under 30 years. It's long, and so it's literally my favorite glass. Um, I'm putting in a big rock 
the ice guys is absolutely crucial right but i'm not going to make it in the glass you can if you like some people make this drink in the glass i like one big ice cube better than many because it obviously melts slower you're going to mix you're going to stir this you're not going to shake it okay this is not a shaking drink and i know i'm probably speaking to people who know what they're doing so i don't need to go into it too much but if it's all alcohol which this is you stir you do not shake despite what james bond would like you to believe um here you go i'm going to fill this up with some ice now it is probably the simplest cocktail in the world because it's a one to one to one you can't get it wrong right it's and one of the reasons why it's so popular all around the world is because it is a one to one to one there is not you're not asking people to help you know to, a bartender to, to put his sort of touch on it it's simple anywhere you go in the world they can't get it wrong it's one to one to one so if you've got the same ingredients you're going to get the same drink that's why it's particularly popular. All right, here we go. So, and I say, by the way, one to one to one, but this is when I'm gonna say what, what uh, you know, I'm gonna change it up because I actually prefer more gin. So I'm actually, I like the, you know, I, because it's a bit sweet to me, you know, even though with the Campari, the aperitivo is a little bitter, it's a touch sweet for me. So you can, if you like, and I sometimes reduce the amount of vermouth and by the way, guys, again, the vermouth is crucial. Okay, there isn't a lot to this drink, right? Campari is pretty much your go-to. There are other bitters that you can use, but Campari is kind of like the place. The vermouth, in my opinion, is what changes and shapes this drink. This is one of my favorites. Um, it is the Antica, and have a look at that bottle if you can see it. It's a really beautiful bottle. Uh, it's a, it, it really, it's, it's, I know it's a fortified wine, obviously all vermouths are, but this Antica is the one to go for if you can get your hands on it. Or, you know, another people, another group who make a great one are Ransom, and they have it in-house, they make theirs in Oregon, and you can get, you know, you can try it, but it really changes the flavor and the subtleties. And of course, you could argue that the gin would do that, but in my opinion, if you use a really floral gin in a, in a Negroni, yeah, it'll change the flavor profile quite considerably, but it was really originally designed with a London dry gin. And that's, in my opinion, the way to go. It's super smooth and it really sort of accentuates the drink. Um, this is a Tanqueray. I often go for something very simple, like a beef eater. These are not expensive gins. They're about, you know, the run of the mill gins, but it's perfect for this particular scenario. And as I mentioned, I tend to go a little heavier or quite a lot heavier on the, uh, on the gin. But, <laughs> That's really up to you. That is not the rule of this drink, okay? So, as I said, it's meant to be a drink that you could have made anywhere until you start to change it up and do your own thing with it. You're gonna stir it for about, I like to say 10 seconds minimum, right? So if you see a bartender and they don't really do it for 10 seconds, eh, it's not gonna be cold enough, guys. It's just not, you know, I, I'm sorry. And it, 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 you have to take your time. You just can't do it for like four seconds. Like sometimes you see in the bar, they give it two or three good shakes and, and you're done. And by the way, if you do shake it, you're gonna get all kinds of ice, pieces of ice in it, which you're not gonna like. Get just, and then you're gonna pour it right on top. There you go. Oh yeah, beautiful. Now, there are a couple of things. So first of all, get your orange in there. I, by the way, have dried my oranges. Not sure if you've tried doing that. I love to slice the oranges and dry them. It adds extra flavor. They also, that way you pick them up, chew them up. They're delicious after the fact. They're a little snack on the side. Um, and they actually, when you put them into the drink, they soak up the drink in a totally different way than a fresh piece of orange does. So little side piece there. And my wife still likes to add some, um, soda water into her uh, drink, turning it into an Americana Negroni. Uh, but hey, you know what? She's from Alabama. I'm from England. We do things differently all over the world. Cheers, my friends. I even see a family member. Ryan. Hey, there he is. <laughs> Happy to be here. Cheers. How are you? So this is my, my wife's cousin. I love it. Nice to meet you, everyone. And thanks for the Negroni lesson in the background. Ah, my pleasure. Look at you. You've got longer hair than my wife. Uh, it's been a long it. quarantine, it's right? It's been a while since I've seen you. So the <laughs> pandemic is what that, 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 look at that's done to you. It's been a bit, yeah. to me, Ryan, as you can see. Well, every, <laughs> listen, guys, it's fantastic. I, I'd love to hear if you guys have any questions. Let's have a little conversation, a chat. It's fantastic to have a drink with you guys. Hi, Nigel. I brought my wife, Elise, here. 
How did you do? I'll be here, and she made the drinks for us. Your drink, <laughs> and uh, we don't have the orange uh, in there, but uh, it's it's tasting pretty good right now. Fantastic. Yeah. Now, and did you? What were your sort of ingredients? Obviously, you've got Campari. You've got your gin. What gin did you use? Tangeray. Okay. So same as me. And then, did you what did you what you know, do for your um, vermouth? Um, I have to look. I, I'm not sure. I, I just bought it on my way home from work. <laughs> no, I told her we were having drinks with you. <laughs> Absolutely. Fantastic. Nice to meet you. Who else do we have here? Hi, Nigel. Oh, my gosh. I said, I've been watching Top Model since I was a little kid. So this is really exciting. Um, my name is Samantha. I'm from Chicago. I actually had a question that I wrote in the email that I was going to ask. It doesn't have to do with alcohol, though. <laughs> um, That's all good. Yeah. So... I'm a multiracial person, and it's always been really inspiring to see you and your family as kind of a multi-generational, multiracial family and artist and creator. So I was just curious, how does that sort of straddling of cultures impact your creative process? And are you noticing any changes in your creative process or inspiration as your kids grow up? It's, it's interesting. My whole story, you know, as anybody of any sort of color would, would, would can sort of understand, your, your color plays a part of your life no matter what and you don't you know are you sort of it's it's always kind of there you know and it's whether someone looks at you it's a certain way or whatever it was but growing up in the uk when i did in the 70s i was one of the very one of the very few of, of only kids that i knew that were part sri lankan and then part white and as a result you know they i mean now if you go there there's gonna be lots of mixed children but in the 70s that wasn't the case you it was very much one or the other and i spent my life kind of not really fitting into either camp. You know, it was the Sri Lankans were like, oh my goodness, your, your mother married a white person, you know, and they were just as racist actually in, in many respects. And then the whites, you know, side of my family were, like, oh, you know, you're part Sri Lankan and he couldn't figure it out. And I come, you know, my, fat, my, my brothers and sisters, my siblings, they all came out sort of different colors, which was interesting. My younger sister was very pale and I have an older brother who's much darker, um, almost looks like Tamil uh, dark brown. and. You know, and, and, and we're all sort of slightly different. And so it affected everyone in the family differently. And members of my family, many of them had sort of, I guess, identity crisis of their own sorts because of the, 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 how they identified within the family. Because they you know, either wanted to be white or they wanted to be brown. And, and, they, and they weren't one or the other. So they kind of lost that. And that was in, in large part, I'm mentioning this because that's one of the reasons why I sort of left England when I was 18 and started traveling the world. And it was the fashion industry where I found myself to be surrounded by people that were from all over the world, were from were all different colors, were all different sexualities, and none of that mattered. And, and it, people judged you because of your skill, your talent, your sense of humor, and all of those things. That was what was, you know, was important. And I sort of found a home. And then I found New York, and I was like, wow, I've never seen people like this. I've never seen this multicultural sort of city of New York. And, and that's, and I literally, I, as soon as I arrived, and I first came to New York in 91, but I settled here in 96. And I, it was like, I had found myself. I mean, I, I, you know, you'd walk into the street and it was like being on Star Wars, you know, when you go into the bar and it was all people of all different shapes and sizes and like, look how hot are aliens everywhere. And I'm like, wow, this is fantastic. We're all aliens. We, I can be an alien too. You know, this is wonderful. And, you know, and, and so that was sort of a part of it. You know, my wife is um, Chinese, half Chinese. And, um, you know, her story similar. She grew up in Alabama, you know, so you can imagine being Chinese in Alabama. Her grandfather was the first Chinese baby born in the state of Alabama, you know, um, so, you know, they, they found themselves down there because, you know, when their family first came to America, they literally looked for a place where there were no Chinese and thought, what can the Chinese do? Well, we can, you know, open a restaurant, we can do a laundry business, we can do various things. They don't have that here in Alabama. We're going to go there and rock it. And they basically headed down there with only a couple of words of English that they knew, which were sort of eggs and ham. This is a true story. They found themselves down there. They opened up a laundry business. And it became the most successful laundry business in the southern states of America um, by with o over the next 75 years. And they sold out for a small fortune in the 80s, uh, changing their whole family's sort of shape. But they had multiple factories with chin factories. We have photographs in my house 
with uh, factories which say chin laundry with 50 Model T cars outside of it with chin laundry on the top. It's like the true American success story from coming from nothing, literally zero, not just the clothes on your back off a boat, going to Alabama and checking. So, you know, all of this plays into my family's history. And so I, when I, you know, going back to your, you know, your very original question, as I'm now, you know, dealing with my own children, you know, and I'm living upstate New York, racism is still abounds, you know, and, and it's still issues. And, 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 you know, my son's come home with spit in his hair and, and being called names and all of that kind of thing. And it happens, right? But it's also a part of the world. And so you, you, you teach them and you learn, and the most important thing I teach them is to love and to care, but to love themselves and have compassion for themselves. And, that, and then to pile that out. And they're lucky because they have a very strong family around them and people who care about them. And, and, they're, and they're very creative. And so they, you know, they express themselves through art, through dance. And now my, whole, every, my entire life is around my kids, as it should be. You know, that's the next generation. And, you know, my son's into NFTs and painting and drawing and murals. And he did a crazy mural in Brooklyn and his kid's only 16 and my daughter's dancing. So it's, it's so important. But I also, you know, take them back to the countries that they came from, Sri Lanka. Um, we're going to do a trip to China next. And, you know, it's, it's so important that they understand their roots and they feel it. And, and I remember my son, when I took him to Sri Lanka, said to me, God, Dad, this is the first time I've seen kids that for some reason I look like them. You know, because he'd never really thought about it. And I, and I remember when I was a kid and I went to Sri Lanka for the first time and I just didn't know, because you don't think about it until you see it. And then you're like, I'm not different. I'm actually, that, 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 that looks like me. <laughs> and that's a big deal. So there you go. It's a long-winded question, a long-winded uh, long answer, but there you go. Hi, Nigel. It's Lynn. How are you? Hey, Lynn. How are you doing? I'm fine. Is How are you, you doing? This is Lynn Nagel. <laughs> yes. Hi. So Lynn, I've never met you, but we never met really, but we, I mean, I know you from Instagram. You are, you are very supportive. Thank you very much for being on here. I appreciate it. Well, thank you support for supporting me as well. I appreciate that as well. I know that you've had an illustrious career as a photographer and then also as a male model. Is there any other career you maybe could have fallen into if you didn't do that? Well, bartending is um, definitely <laughs> possible. Um, <laughs> well, you know, who knows? You know, the funny thing is, is that before I was even, you know, trying to be a photographer, or trying to be even a model for that matter, which, by the way, was yonks ago, late 80s is when I started modeling. Um, and I finished in 94, five. So before half of you were even born, probably. But um, you know, the, the reality is, is that I was actually headed to medical school. So I had studied biology, ke chemistry, physics, and maths, and was destined to go to medical school. And the long story short is that my mother entered me, entered me into a modeling competition. And um, be careful, parents, what you actually do, let your kids do, because they were like, you know, I, I didn't win. I got in the top three. And it's ironic because it was a televised modeling competition, which was one of the very first of its kind. And um, I, I sort of, my parents said, look, if you're going to go to medical school, it's going to be seven, eight years. It's a graft. It costs a lot of money. Do a bit of modeling, have some fun, see the world, you know, go to medical school. Okay, cool. I went, I started modeling. I had a really successful first year and, um, and they were like, oh, wow, wow. Okay. Do it for two years. You know, you get some bank and then you can go back. Cause it's, you know, and I was, I was like, oh, okay, that's probably a good idea. Not to mention, Hey, you know what I mean? Traveling the world, you're 18, 19 years old you know, great money, beautiful people, all the rest of it. I'm like, okay, I, I can do this. This is cool. This is not the parochial little world of boarding school that I had existed in. So I had had a very sheltered, privileged life. And, um, you know, I, the problem is, is after two years, I had also done rather well in my second year. My, my parents then came up to me and said, so Nigel, now it's time to go to school, the school, back to school and, you know, study medicine. And I'm like, I actually, I don't, I don't want to go. And they're like, yeah, it doesn't matter if you don't want to go, you're going. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like I, I, actually, I, I really don't want to go. Um, and they said, um, no, no, you have to go. I'm like, I, I actually don't have to go. And they're like, we're cutting you off. I'm like, yeah, that's really not a problem. <laughs> um, and they were like, what? And they the thing is, is I had made some money and I had made quite a bit of money in those two years. And I was sort of, and I didn't need much. When you're 19, 20 years old, what do you need? Happy to sleep on someone's couch, right? So. You know, and I was like, you kidding me? 
You see, you see what I'm living, doing right now? I'm going to go back to school, to college, to study medicine. And by the way, I don't even like people that much that I want to actually be a doctor. I'm like, are you kidding me? I mean, hey, joking aside, you know, it takes a lot. Doctors are very special people. They have to sit there. You have to, people come in, they complain. This hurts, that hurts. I mean, I'm like, really? I don't think that's really for me. You know, and, um, you know, so I, I stayed on and eventually they kind of got it. You know, but um, it, it took a moment. I mean, I, I think even still to this day, my parents sort of still say, you know, what is it that you do? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, hey, there you go. There you go. That's fascinating. Thank you. Hey. My name's Rochelle. I know we met long time ago, about like five, six years ago at Hi, the Rochelle. New Ballet Gala. I, I, I was like mesmerized. I was like, oh my God, it's Nigel Parker. Oh. <laughs> it was like such an honor to meet you. But one of my questions, so I model full time and I'm also a state finalist for Miss New York USA. And I noticed you were actually Congrats. judged for the Miss USA competition a couple years ago. And one of my questions was, what's one piece of advice that you were given that stuck with you throughout your whole entire career? So yeah, look, great question and congratulations and all the rest of it for all your successes. And you know, I, I, I think it's it's one of those things. I mean, I obviously was a judge on Top Model for eighteen seasons. I worked on the face. I, I've also judged Miss World, Miss Universe, and Miss USA, as well as pageants all over the world. So I'm, I'm, I I know the field. I know it very well. The most important piece of advice, and I and I this is it's simple and it's one thing, and I tell everyone this, is that you have to be your own critic, if you like. And, and it's ironic, because obviously, I'm a judge on shows. And so I'm judging. But, you know, when anyone says to me, am I worth it? Do I have what it takes? And I get it every day, all the time, like I'm multiple DMs, if not more a day, and sometimes hundreds, you know, it can be crazy, especially during fashion, you know, fashion weeks and things like that one, it's right on everyone's mind. The point being here is that it's like being an artist, you know, if you're an artist, and you're always asking someone, you know, do you like my picture? And, and you're waiting for approval, then, it, you know, you, you're not, you're, first of all, you're not love, in love with, you don't know when to stop what you're doing, you don't know how to edit what you're doing, but it, you, it has to be about what you want to do. You have to have your own, we talk about this, and I know Tyra talked about this on Top Model, but it's about your signature, it's about who you are. And it's, and then in a way, social media has helped this. And there are a lot of people out there who are sort of modeling, if you like, in, in, the, in the world now, in different ways, who are perhaps just models, they are influencers, their personalities, their characters, and that is much more powerful. And that's always been the case, by the way. So if you look at historically at the models who became sort of supermodels, or the most successful winners, it was and even on the Miss World, Miss USA, Miss Universe, it's really that personality aspect that changes it. And some people may laugh and go, oh, come on, personality, really, they're just really beautiful, she's got a great body, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But guess what? They all do, right? But what is different is the fact that when someone opens their mouth and they speak and they talk, what comes out? What knowledge? What brilliance? What talent? What skill? What confidence? You know, that's the stuff that is sexy. That's what turns somebody on. That's what's charismatic. That's what draws you to someone. So you have to have that. And it's not easy to have. It's not easy. One thing for me to say you have to have it because you're like, well, where do I get it from? You know, and some people are innately born with a lot of confidence and some people are very meek. Meanwhile, neither one is better than the other, right? It, it, it's, there's a very fine line between conceit and, and confidence. And, and, you, and you, you know, it's, it's not about thinking that you are better than the next person. It's about realizing your own worth and knowing that you are worth it and that you have what it takes. And that when you, if you can, if you can realize that you've got, you're, you're, you're enough, then that it opens up infinite doors for yourself. And so that is the number one piece of advice I give people, whether they're a photographer, whether they're a model, or no matter what they're doing in the world, you know, because I'm an entrepreneur, I'm, I have my fingers in lots of different pies, I do all kinds of different businesses. And it is about knowing that even if you get it wrong, you're getting it right. If you are okay with it, you, it's up to you. Imagine Van Gogh painting something and saying, should I put another sunflower in there? You know what I mean? He's not asking your opinion. He's just stopping putting his paintbrush down and going, I'm done. You know, sadly, the guy never sold a picture in his life except to his brother-in-law. But he's now the most successful or the most, you know, celebrated artist in history, right? It, 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 that's one of those things where it's a very painful thing because we live in a society where it's all about being liked. 
It's all about having hearts. It's all about having people approve you, having how many followers do you have? It's all of those things which do not equate re in reality to success, really. And, and, I, and, I, and I, what I mean by that is I now, in my stage of my life, and I have chased the same dreams as everybody else, would tell you that nothing makes me happier than my family or and, and not money, not success, not having access to lots of things. That does not make me happier. Happy is is the small things in life and understand and, and that's so and again another long answer, but it's a really good question and I think it's so important. Thank Cheers, you, Tom, That helped a lot. Thank you so much. Of course. Hi Nigel, my name's Ashley. So I have uh, my own podcast as well. It's focused more so on dating differences around the world. And a question I have for you is for someone that's starting out and like kind of what you're just saying, like doesn't really have like a big following yet, doesn't have like all those likes. Um, like what would you, rec like how do you recommend for someone to like break into that space and like what tips do you have for them? And how do you recommend for someone to like keep going when, it's kind of hard um, in that space. Like what uh, other tips like do you have for, for someone starting out? Yeah, I mean, again, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's, a good, it's a great question. I mean, ultimately it boils down to, you know, doing what you can to be heard, you know, to get yourself heard. You know, it's, it, it, there are a lot of great people podcasting right now. There's a lot of great conversations out there. Uh, you know, there's, it's about having an angle too. It's what differentiates you. There's sort of several different areas here. There's one, obviously, there's the marketing aspect. There's sort of, you know, because you can have a great, for example, you can have a fantastic book, right? You, you've probably all been to a library where you've seen incredible books on the wall, but they're all leather bound in, in sort of red leather or blue leather with sort of gold. They, they all look the same. So how do you know which book you're going to pick off? You know, unless you recognize the title. And so, and then there's one book that whatever reason you put, it, it, so you need to kind of, it, you know, you, you'd never know what was inside. You'd never find all that fantasticness inside that thing. So you know, you, there is an element of needing to be, to sort of scream off the shelf a little bit from a marketing standpoint. But I always say start from the inside because a lot of people are really good at marketing, but actually crap at content, right? So it's all cover and there's nothing on the inside. Right. So, you know, you can be really, you know, glossy on the outside, super sexy, everyone's fascinated, and then they dip in and it's like eh, nothing. Right. So, you know, you want to kind of like realize that start with what your content is, you know, make sure it's as good as it can possibly be in, you know, really study your subject, be knowledgeable about what you're doing, you know, really build up that great sort of storyline, create a format that, that people can follow. People love a recipe. You know, so, and I say that because if you don't have a good recipe you know, or a good format, it's confusing for people. They, they, they kind of like, you know, despite the fact that people like change, they love to know when they get spaghetti bolognese that it tastes like spaghetti bolognese. Yeah, it could be the best spaghetti bolognese ever, you know, like the best cooked pasta and the best cooked, you know, reds, but it's the same thing ultimately. It's just the best of it. Right. So, but you have to keep that kind of recipe. You don't go there and then someone's really messed up the spaghetti bolognese thing, you know, the kid's face goes, you know, they're not happy from it. Right. So, you know, I think it's the same thing. Think of it that way. And then when it comes to really starting to market yourself, you know, one of the things that I do is I reach out to people directly through social media and I say hello and I send them my podcast and I send them things that I'm doing. And I connect directly with people I have no idea who they are. I just see them because I see them and following me. And I decide, and what, what I do every week is I look at about 10 or 20 people that I do not know on social media whatsoever. And I reach out and I say, hello. And normally they're like, whoa, you know, like this is, you know, what am I being spammed? What's going on? And I'm like, nah, I just saw you, you know, hi, how you doing? What's going on? Bye. And, and, and it's, and, and it sort of and it touches you know them in, in a way where it's like guess what I'm human too, you know we're all human and and it's a, that connection, and you say look this is what I'm doing this is what I'm about you may find it interesting, and, it, and it's just that personal touch there is not much person personal touch with social media, you, you know it feels like it is but it's not it's very much voyeurism, so if you were able to break that that gap down, you'll find that you can get it and by hook or by crook. Even if it's 10 extra watches a week, you know, 10 extra downloads a week, before you know it, that 
spread, 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 spread as people start to share the word and what have you. And before you know it, you have an audience. Hi, Nigel. I'm Charlotte. Thanks hey, Charlotte. for having us here today. Um, so I'm a big gin drinker. So I'm just wondering what measurements do you use when you make your drink? Which drink? Your Negroni. Oh, my Negroni? Well, I actually do two shots of, um, I use Tanqueray today, London Dry. You're meant to do one. I normally, I okay. do two. However, let me get, get something for you. Give me a second here. I'm going to go to my fridge. And this is a non-sponsored um, endorsement here. I should be sponsored. I probably my producers would kill me for doing this. But this is a really good gin, right? It's called Bar Hill. And my wife adores it. So if you haven't had it already before, if you, those of you who have, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's unique. There are so many interesting gins. Gin is having an absolute resurgence, as you probably all know. I started making Negronis with Bar Hill and I have another gin in here. Where is it? There you go. No, yeah, this is another Bar Hill actually. But you can, but this is a Tomcat gin. Uh, and if you can see, it's sort of brown in color, right? So the Tomcat gins are the ones that, this is the original gin. And it was uh, basically, they, they, keep, they put them in um, oak casks. I think it's the color from the oak casks. So that, and literally just like a whiskey, it, it, and it takes the color, right? The tannins and what have you. Um, interesting thing about this gin is that they make it from honey and, and it's made in Vermont and it has a real sweet honey taste. And if you put it inside Negroni, it gives it a really great flavor. Absolutely delicious. The honey comes through and, and, it's, and, it, and it's, it totally changes the drink completely. So the bitters and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the sort of the honey aspect work really nicely together. And I think it's also because of the orange, because like orange and honey just go really well together. Um, one of my favorite honeys is an orange honey. I'm fascinated with gin because it's, it's something where, which is, you know, gin, people don't realize this, but gin predates vodka by about 400 years. So gin is a, a drink that's been around for, they, they date it about 500 years, gin. Um, and it's a, the original moonshine. And, and the reason why it's sort of developed and specifically in sort of Northern Europe was because as you're making moonshine, and if anyone's actually had original moonshine, which I've had a few times, it's pretty yucky stuff. It's, <laughs> it's pretty like, it's caustic. You feel like you're drinking like, you know, medical alcohol or something and burns down your throat and all the rest of it. And it smells pretty wicked too. So, you know, they would go out and literally find all the botanicals um, juniper being the most popular for gin and, and, you know, find all the different things in the woods, literally outside and wherever they could to flavor it and to make it smell better. So they could literally be palatable to drink. And, and gin was, you know, it was, as, as I mentioned, one of the very original vodka only has a provenance of about a hundred years. So it's, it's, it's really a modern drink. Um, and it's partly because of the distillation process that you need to make vodka. Um, interestingly enough, but, um, but anyway, I, I'm a big I'm a big fan of gin. I have lots of gins, lots of different types of gins. I'm all about gins. Um, my favorite drink, though, and I, again, I probably shouldn't even say what my favorite is, because again, people are like, oh, you've got to have a favorite. But you know, what everyone has a bit of a go-to, uh, and, and I'm a tequila man. So you know, yeah. if any of you are tequila people, I'm a tequila person. So you know, there you go. I would probably want to ask because I I do chit chat with Chrissy a lot on her on her own. You know, I think she's. Super cool. But I just want to know how you, I mean, I know the story of how you guys met, but how do you guys keep it balanced in your marriage? Because she has her own things going on. You have your things going on. But you guys always seem to meet in the middle and it seems very balanced. And I know there's not like one um, recipe to make it work, but how do you guys make it? Because it always looks like you guys have fun. You guys... I'm sure there's a lot more in the background that we don't see, but you guys really do balance it out. And I think that's really important in a relationship. So I just was wondering what sort of key takeaways do you guys have to keep it going as long as it has? Well, you know, you know what, first of all, I'll say that the number one thing is the fact when a guy calls, you know, gets on a Zoom and says, I do chit chat with your wife. You know, the fact that that in itself, the fact that I can handle that is the, probably the number one reason why our relationship is, is successful. Because when, I, when a guy hears that some other guy is chatting with his wife, you know, and, and he's cool about it, that's the reason why you have a successful relationship. You know, but joking aside, that is the truth. 
right? So if I if I boil it down, because yeah. I have, you know, my wife is the most loyal, wonderful person in the world, but that's it. It's called trust. And it's called, and, and I would say that my, our relationship is built on trust. And if nothing else, I can't tell you, I can't mention a single time in, I mean, Chrissy and I have been together since 1994, right? So we're talking 28 years. She has never once ever questioned me or doubted me about anything or I've ever done at any point ever about any shoot, about any moment. She never said, oh, you know, or been jealous of the model I've worked with or, you know, that she might be scantily clad, she might, whatever, you know, it doesn't, that, that doesn't factor into her thing. She's not, that's not a part of the equation. You know, it, 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 she's like, no, you come back to me, I'm your wife, right? It's, and that's the deal. And it's sort of like, and there's an element of, and, and it's her confidence, because she's an incredibly confident person. You know, she's an unbelievably unique individual who's just a ray of light. And, 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 for, and, and I've never met anyone like her, you know, so, you know, anyone knows how crazy devoted I am to, to her, you know, and not to mention she's got an identical twin. So it, it, it's not as if, you know, she's sort of unique in looks. It's not, she's actually got someone who looks identical to her, but she's unique in personality, right? So it, it's, it's, that's how you know, specific it is. Um, but I think it, it all boils down to trust. It all boils down to the fact that, and I, and I feel like it's so important, you know, and this is just a little backstory, but you know, Chrissy and I, when we met in 94, we never lived together until we got married, which was in 1999. And we travel all over the world together but she got her apartment and I got my apartment. And that's not necessarily that I, that I wanted necessarily to do that. I, I think I, at one point I even tried to move in with her, but her father who was a Baptist minister at the time. Um, and it was good. You know, Ryan, I'm not sure if you even know this story, but he was like, you know, he said to me, ah, you're not moving in with them. And, and, I, and, I, and I respected it. And I was like, okay, sure, absolutely. Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Chin. Um, and, um, but I was you know, obsessed with, to be close to them. So when they moved to Paris, I moved to Paris, got my own apartment. You know, when they were in Milan, I had my own apartment in Milan. You know, when they went to New York, I got my own apartment in New York. And the brilliant part of that was that we were very young. Chrissy was 19, I was 22. And I think that had we lived together, we would have smothered one another. You're too young, you're growing up and it gave us space. And we were able to spend five years dating, and not living on each other's heads. And you know, I had, and I was sharing an apartment with three other guys, and she was sharing an apartment with her sister. And we would see each other all the time. You know, we were dating constantly, obviously, and we never broke up at, during that point. But it gave us time to breathe, right? So I think that that was so important. We became good friends, and then once we got married, we spent another five years before we even had kids. So there was a decade of us being together as lovers, as friends that solidified our relationship. And then we had kids. And I, I remember when we first started having kids, my, everyone, first of all, was like, can you even have kids? Because you've been together for 10 years and you haven't had a kid, you know? And I was like, yeah, look, we're not in a rush. I met her when she was 19. I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, what, why do you have to be on our backs? And, you know, but it was perfect timing because that, you know, we had had this history. We hadn't, we didn't feel like we had to sort of, you know, filling in the gaps, we knew each other. And to this day, you know, Chrissy and I are like soulmates. And, you know, and actually funny enough, if for those of you who don't know, like Kimmy and Chrissy, they're identical twins, but Kimmy is sort of opposite to Chrissy. And, and, and they're sort of like yin and yang. In as much as like Chrissy likes blue, Kimmy likes pink. Chrissy will literally put on something pink and go, oh, this looks awful on me. And her sister will put it on and go, oh my God, this looks amazing. And I'm like, oh my God, you're identical twins. Are you crazy? Like you are both identical. You look the same. Like, what do you mean? But it's the confidence that pulls the pink off on one and the blue off on the other. And that just shows how important confidence is to going back to that point. Because if you're not confident in pink, it doesn't look good on you. And I literally look at my wife in pink and go, eh, it doesn't really work. And then her sister puts it on. And I'm like, oh my God, it looks great. I'm like, what? That doesn't even make sense. They're identical. But it's because they believe in it, right? And so going back to that, my, my um, sister-in-law also likes spicy food. My wife likes bland food. It's all the way through. But I, for example, like spicy food. I'm very much like Kimmy. And so I feel that 
her, you know, I, she sort of found, I, I'm, 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 I'm literally, when I'm with Kimmy, Kimmy and I do all the same things. It's sort of, we're like almost identical in, in our own way. And so I think that also helps because with Chrissy, she's the opposite. So we kind of complement one another. So there you have it. Such a great just, story, Nigel. I had no idea that Uncle Richard made you guys live separately for so long. So. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Meanwhile, he looked a bit like you at the time. He had long hair, except he had a beard. And uh, you know, I remember that you know he was living on his boat, and, and you know, and he came over, and he was like, you know, and he's he'd gone right into the sort of he was really deep into the Baptist moment, you know, and, and you know, and it was super religious and all the rest of it. And, and I was like, wow, okay. I, and I was unaware of this because coming from the UK, didn't really understand what this was. He's this guy from Alabama, you know, right into his thing. So he was like, uh -uh, this isn't going to happen. And I remember him sitting me down very, you know, and have, giving me the talk. And I was, but I was like, look, I, I'm, I'm in for the long term. This is good. This is, I'm in, you know, this is not, I don't need to rush anything. I, and, and to be honest, I think it was more economic than anything else, which is not a good reason. Unfortunately, it's normally the reason that it happened, the reason why people get move in together, which is probably the worst reason, you know, because it's uh, not healthy for one another. So. Nigel, hey. hi. Hey. My name is Mike. I'm from the southern tier of New York, and um, I uh, enjoy uh, interacting with you uh, on Instagram. With That's some right, of our Mike. I know who you are now. How are you? That's right. How are you doing? So I wanted to touch base uh, on two things. Number one was the, the medical stuff that you were talking about. That's the field that I'm in. So I get to listen to people's complaints all day long. So that's why I came for the alcohol. <laughs> Absolutely, Mike. So this is I a wonderful you. drink. This is a wonderful drink. And I appreciate that because this is my first experience with gin. So I am normally no bourbon and whiskey. Yeah, yeah. Normally I'm bourbon and whiskey. So this was... a a delight to uh to try and experience so thank you the second part was i, I wanted to uh, send a shout out to your son um it's pretty cool i want to show you this my daughter let's see love it she's 11 my daughter's 11 and this was her first t-shirt she just made this about a month ago and i had shown her maybe a few months back your son's like monster sweatshirts and i'm like look this is really cool he's He's doing the marketing stuff. He's sending this out. I'm like, you can do this. You're an artist. And she took that. And she's like, this is really fun. So she makes these melty faces. And uh, she's got a collection upstairs. We just did her first t-shirt. So thanks uh, to your son for kind of exposing that little realm for my 11-year-old daughter. Wow. That is, that is major. That is so nice to hear. And I tell you what, he, he'll be stoked to hear that too. That he's, you know, he's just... It's it, first of all that, that next generation. It's so wonderful what opportunity they ha they have and that, how they can express themselves. And you know there are, there is you know plus points to social media. I mean there, you know, there are elements where we can communicate, we can meet people. And Mike, you're someone who I, I you know you and I have communicated over the years through social media. And I remember you now because and I, I know you as sort of Mike on social media, but I, I sort of recognized yeah. your face partially. But come on, like me, like all of us, even my Zoom picture that comes up it doesn't quite look like us. You know, we have a right. there's a way where Zoom needs to be a bit more, you know, it needs to be a little bit more attractive. That's why I backed myself up. You may see that I'm all the way over here. You can't really see me. You know, I like it that way. I'm, I'm I'm back several feet. Um, that helps me. But, you know, I really appreciate it. It's, it's so exciting with Jack, what he's doing right now, um, you know, creating these monsters that he calls them. And, you know, they're all out of his imagination. And, you know, it's, it's super fun, super exciting. And it, it, I think for all of us, the lesson I get from my son is that is to be joyous in what I do. You know, he finds so much fun out of it. He, it this is all born, by the way, out of the pandemic. You know, often people are like, oh, the pandemic was such a bad thing. And so, so bad. But for him, he found this moment where he was, you know, he was homeschooled during the pandemic, like so many children, stuck behind his computer. And he started to just, when I didn't even know it, he was drawing and creating these creatures, these, these sort of things, these monsters that he called them. And then I remember coming into his room one day and I saw them and he kind of hid it and shut it. And I'm like, oh, what are you doing? You know, are you doing your homework? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I've done my homework. I finished. I'm like, well, what was that? And he's like, and he sort of opened his computer. And I was like, I'm like, oh, that's really cool. I mean, what is that? And yeah. he's like, oh, you like it? And I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, I got a few more. And I'm like, okay. And he, he started to show me. And I was like, 
man, these are really cool. I'm like, what, what are they? And they, they're like, I'm calling them monsters. I'm like, what do you mean monsters? Like a monster? And he's like, yeah, but a monster, like a star, they're like a monster. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, they, I'm like, so, I'm like you, do you know about something called NFTs? And he's like, yeah, of course I do, dad. And I'm like, well, of course you do. I guess I'm, I'm slow to the, to the learning curve. And I'm like, well, would you want to do some NFTs with these? I mean, I think they could be cool. I don't know much about it. Anyway, you know, he did his first launch of NFTs last year in November. They sold out in an hour. Right? The kid yeah, made that's awesome. The kid made thousands of dollars in an hour. He and it blew his mind. Poof. Like that, right? Like, what the heck happened? You know, and you know, he's since gone on to do a mural for Macy's. He's getting booked to do private um, pieces for collections. He's just done his second commission. He's got a third commission now. And, and they're blowing them up six feet by five feet by 10 feet, like crazy sizes. You know, and he's a 16 year old kid, but, he, but he's very humble. And you know what he did? And this is something which he, no one even knows. But when he did his last drop, and he did a drop of, his, of merchandise with clothes, which by the way, sold out in 24 hours as well. He then went to school and did a private drop where he just um, gave everything to everybody at exactly cost. There was no write up because he wanted his friends to have them. He didn't want it just to be a money making thing. It was like, here you go. He told all his friends, he's like, if you want to get one, this is just what it costs. I'm not taking any money. You just, I just want you to be able to have one. And now when we drive through town, we see kids wearing his sweatshirts and my wife will just stop the car and be like, hey, and kids will just turn around and it's it's so cool to have that happen it, you know it, it's yeah. sort of like wow okay you know that's that next that next moment so i really hope it for your, yeah. for your daughter too it's super exciting it forces us to learn a lot really quick because again nfts and crypto stuff and how that all works and producing merchandise it is it's good for me right it's just good for us to kind of be involved in those kids lives and watch doors open. So congrats to him. I think that's awesome. All right, guys, I appreciate it. Thank you for joining the Shaking and Stirred Happy Hour. I hope to see you again on another one. We're going to have more. Hope to see you again soon. Thanks so much. This podcast was produced and edited by Embassy Road.